Friends, I think at this point we'll close down the forum this afternoon. <clears throat> Most speakers generally start out by saying how happy they are to be here. And I suppose I would normally follow that procedure if I did not feel hesitant to tell a lie this afternoon. The two most uncomfortable things for me in conjunction with uh, my role as a gospel preacher is conducting funerals and conducting open forums. I had a funeral on Monday and I've got the open forum this afternoon and that should just about finish me off for the week. Sincerely, I always feel inadequate to an occasion of this nature. And I'll tell you why. When I address myself to serious questions that brethren have with reference to the Bible, I really like to give it a lot of deliberation. I like to do my research, weigh all of the information that bears upon that particular theme, and decide very critically and carefully how I want to respond, and then attempt to do so in the clearest and most precise and intelligible fashion possible. And you can't always do that in a situation of this nature. I think brethren who are competent to handle open forum situations are a rather unusual breed. They have to be able to have a rich reservoir of Bible knowledge, but in addition to that, they must be able to think quickly on their feet and correctly, then to be able to present it in such a clear fashion that people do not misunderstand what they say. And I don't have a lot of confidence in my abilities all along the whole line that's involved here. I have frequently wished I were more like Brother Alan Hires, who has a rich depository of Bible knowledge and is quick thinking on his feet and is able to express himself so clearly. And he is truly remarkable in, in that respect. As I listen to Alan conduct the forums various places from time to time, I get the feeling that he could take almost any subject and just talk on it all afternoon practically, whether he knew anything about it or not. <laughs> he has the natural ability there that many of us would, would envy. Now I want to make another preliminary observation before we get into the questions uh, specifically. And that is, as I noticed going through these questions, uh, a lot of them deal with areas that are highly subjective. They address matters that are matters of degree. They address themselves to certain abuses that uh, perhaps in initial stages may be rather innocent. But somewhere along the line, we begin to see dangers in these things, and it becomes a subjective matter as to where you draw the line and when the church has gone too far, etc. I don't hesitate to give an answer to something that I have a strong conviction about. I am not ashamed of anything that I believe the Bible to teach. And I can be very forthright and confident in that and have no fear of doing so. 
But there are areas where I just do not know how far to go or what the precise answer may be. I think rather than being uh, dogmatic in certain areas of this nature that we need to suggest that this is my judgment as to what the Bible teaches and we must make up our own minds respectively on these various matters. And I'll explain more along the lines of what I'm talking about as we go along this afternoon. Now let's do it this way. We'll take a question and I'll briefly address myself to it. And then at that point, if you want to disagree with it or amplify it or comment on it, we can go ahead and do that. Rather than going through an hour or so here and then we try to remember what was said 45 or 50 minutes earlier. We'll work our way along getting as many of these as we possibly can. And I think some of these were left for me. Uh, sort of sifted to the bottom here, as some of the other forum speakers observed the Passover on some of these. Number one, is there scriptural authority for the elders to select other elders in the church? Well, the Bible does not give any specific information on how elders are to be selected. Having said that, I would suggest, however, that there are some principles and some common sense guidelines that would help the church in following a scripturally balanced procedure for selecting elders. Now, in the first place, in Acts chapter 6, when the church needed to select certain men to take care of a benevolent responsibility, the apostles suggested that the church should look out from among themselves men of faith and wisdom who could be appointed to this particular task. Now, I suggest that that passage contains a principle, a common sense principle. These men are going to be serving you. They had a rather tense situation there. When some of the Grecian Jews began to complain that their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. And so the apostles with seasoned wisdom said to them, Look out from among yourselves men who will satisfy your need, who will satisfy your disposition in this regard. And so men were chosen to fulfill that responsibility. Now, elders are to be leaders of the church. Unless the church selects men whom they have confidence in to lead them, to guide them, to rule the local congregation. You will have a situation that is courting disaster. No group of men can lead a group of people that is unwilling to be led by them. And so, even though a congregation may have elders, and the elders may use their spiritually seasoned good judgment in guiding the congregation, in recommending certain men who may be qualified for the eldership, in the final analysis, the church must be the one that chooses the elders. I do not believe that it's consistent with biblical principles for elders to be a self-perpetuating board. There are a lot of dangers built into a situation of that nature. So even though there are no specific instructions in the Bible, there are principles, I think, that guide us in the proper selection of the church's overseers. Now, does anyone have a comment or an observation that you'd like to make in connection with that. 
feel free to do it. All right, question number two. Does 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 26 teach solo or group singing in the assembly? I had another question along the very same line. And this is a concern that a lot of brethren have today because of certain tendencies that we see developing in the church. I think this is one of those questions that uh, I suggested a moment ago is an area where there has to be some degree of judgment exercised. Now it seems to me that there are two opposite extremes in uh, this connection. First of all, an individual might conceivably argue the proposition that it's wrong at any time for a Christian or a group of Christians to sing in the presence of other Christians who are not singing. And to me that would be an unwarranted conclusion. I think then at the opposite extreme there is the position being advocated now in some of our congregations that there's nothing unscriptural about having a church choir. And that we can, in fact, uh, have services where we have an appointed choir that will sing songs before the congregation in which the church as a whole does not participate. Now, somewhere between those opposite extremes, good judgment and scriptural reasoning, it would seem to me, finds a happy medium. For example, let me raise this question. Is it wrong for the church to conduct a funeral service and not have congregational singing but have a group that sings? For years we have been having the type of services where it started out, I think, in this way, After the church regularly met for its worship service, then perhaps a dismissal prayer would be offered and then a college group would come in and the chorus would sing. And then that has begun to evolve into a circumstance where it's not separate now from the assembly, but the college chorus comes in and they conduct the Sunday evening service and they have a sermon and song and they sing one song after another and the congregation listens. And our brethren began to reason, what is the difference between that and having a local group, some of our own people who are good singers, on a Sunday night once a month? or more frequently than that, to do a special singing service. It seems to me that the thrust of the New Testament teaching is this, when the church is assembled together for the purpose of worshiping God, the thing authorized by such passages as Ephesians 5.19 and the parallel in Colossians chapter 3 is congregational singing where there is reciprocal action involved, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I think there's a terribly dangerous tendency now towards theatrics and performance worship. I think God Almighty intended for all of His people to worship together rather than for one group getting before the other and doing what we might call a proxy worship because of their alleged special skills. Well now, the argument being employed by some these days to justify solo singing in congregational worship and chorus singing are a couple of these passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
verse 26 and also verse 15 is employed to this end. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul said, Each one of you hath a psalm, a revelation, etc., etc. And we are told that that constitutes biblical authority for an individual getting up before the church and singing a psalm. It seems to me, brethren, that that line of argumentation is divorcing the passage from its miraculous context. Now, if I understand the thrust of 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, the totality of that section is dealing with spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle lists a number of different spiritual gifts. He shows the unity that's characteristic of them and the fact that the source is the operation of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 13, he shows the attitude that ought to characterize those who possess spiritual gifts. They ought to do so in an atmosphere of love, consideration for their brethren. And incidentally, in that connection, he also shows the duration of those spiritual gifts. And a very wonderful place to do it because he contrasts the temporary nature of spiritual gifts with the permanency of love and qualities of that nature. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul deals with the proper use of spiritual gifts while these were in the church's possession. Now, spiritual gifts were vehicles for the communication of truths in the infant church in the absence of the completion of God's written revelation. And therefore, you have a unique circumstance. It is my conviction, therefore, that 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, and also verse 26 indicates that in that early infantile setting of the church, that God, as a method of instruction, sometimes gave them inspired songs and inspired prayers. They had to learn how to sing. They had to learn what to sing. They had to learn how to pray. And God, by means of these supernaturally endowed individuals, gave them instruction along those lines. But I think it would be an extremely tentative position to suggest that you can extract those passages from that supernatural context and apply them across the board in the Lord's church for all time. Now, there are principles that certainly would be applicable, but you've got to recognize the unique situation involved there. Now, let's take 1 Corinthians 14, 15 for an example. Paul said... I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Let's assume for a moment that we're talking about a divinely given prayer and a divinely given song. In the case of the prayer, once the prayer was received and it was taught to the church and then the church incorporated it into its body of information and began to pray it in that fashion. Would it not be the case, consistent with the nature of prayer, that the entire church would be involved in the prayer? Though you might have someone to lead the prayer, everybody prays with the person who leads the prayer. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Now, by the same token, would it not follow that if you had an inspired song given, granted you might have a situation 
where the one with that particular gift taught the song to the congregation. Once the congregation learned the song, given the nature of the situation, would it not be reasonable to assume that the entire congregation then would sing the song rather than one person perpetually sing the song to them, which is what brethren are contending for. So it seems to me that the argument being made on these passages from 1 Corinthians 14 today by those who are opting for chorus and solo singing in the church divorces the passages from their initial context and attempts to apply them to a situation that does not actually apply. Now, I would certainly appreciate any help or any amplification that anybody would like to give on this particular matter. Ramsey. First of all, we are assuming in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, when he says, each one hath a song, that it is to be sung. It could be a psalm that was read. I've heard a lot of psalms read. And the reason I think that's not so far-fetched is in James 5, 13, he says, is any merry among you? Let him sing psalms. The other said, hath a psalm. So a psalm can be read. It can be sung. Also, and this is a very important practical point today, later in that same 14th chapter, it says, let your women keep silence in the assemblies. So that would take care of, if they could establish solo singing, Today, with 1 Corinthians 14, that would eliminate women doing it. I think a lot of times we don't uh, continue in a context. Those are two observations I'd like to make. Very well made. Appreciate those. Brother Foy. A couple of observations I'd like to make. When a group gets up to sing, do they not, by that very action, refuse me permission to sing? Uh, a little quartet gets up, they start performing their songs. If, if someone starts singing along with them, what would it do to them? Somebody might sing out of tune and destroy their whole program. And the very nature of that is they're refusing me permission to sing praises to God at the same time they're doing that. And as far as I'm concerned, it's very dangerous. Some folks around here think that I like to sing a little bit, and that's true. But uh, there are some of my brothers and sisters who don't like to sing at all. I know they don't because it doesn't matter what happens. They don't sing. And I've had some of those who refuse to sing come and tell me, oh, I just love to listen so much. But God said sing. So from those who would say, I can't, to those who refuse to, we go back to the balance in that middle you were talking about just a moment ago. We still have Hebrews thirteen fifteen, which says, Let us offer up then a sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is fruit of lips that make confession to his name. The word humnos is the word used there. Same word in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I personally have never been able to find any significant difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not, not any real significant difference. So we sing praises to God. That is what we do continually. And we still have singing and we still have words. The third observation that I'd like to make is especially with regard to uh, so-called choruses from Christian colleges and the performances that are done by them. I'm aware that a number of years ago, most of the folks who made up the Christian chorus were Christians. But today in our Christian schools, we have folks from all walks of life, those who are uh, religious of sorts, those who are irreligious, just music majors, as well as some Christians. And the question is never asked which one of you is a Christian to engage in the solo, but who has the best voice and the best production? 
and whether it is male or female, we have in those situations people who are not Christians and women leading in the services of God in the assembly, whether it be in the assembly or after the final prayer is, is said and everybody's just staying to listen. We still have women who are leading, they are teaching, they are preaching under some circumstances, quoting passages of scripture, and that where men are present. In fact, we had a situation a few years ago on the campus of one of our Christian colleges where a group of preachers and elders together, even without their wives, uh, were subjected to that kind of thing where uh, we were taught and admonished by women doing solos, quoting scriptures, and speaking in a teaching capacity. So all of these things come together. Wouldn't it just be a lot more wise for us to sing? Exactly. Very good comments. <clears throat> we, are, we are rapidly heading in a direction of uh, tremendous change in the church along these lines. The female ministry is right around the corner. And uh, I was conducting a gospel meeting in Southern California a couple of years ago, and they announced that they were going to have a singing on Sunday afternoon. So when we all convened back at the auditorium, all of these groups began to, to come in. And they were even dressed with matching blazers and all their coordinated outfits, and they even have their individual name, the Gospel Rockettes, and all of this. And I thought, what in the world is going on here? I decided I wanted to do something more spiritual, and I just went back and watched the 49ers. <laughs> Brother Jackson, we have been told of the dangers of the modern versions, but should this be a matter of, matter of fellowship and division among brethren? Well, let's look at this and think about it for just a moment. If the translation issue is to be made a test of fellowship, where do we begin? Do we say that you cannot own a copy of any translation other than, uh, well, first we've got to decide which one it's going to be. Uh, will it be the King James translation? Will it be the American Standard translation? Will it be the New King James Version? Will it be the New American Standard Bible? Or which will it be? We've got to come to some sort of decision as to which translation will be the official translation of the church. And then we must determine to what extent you may or may not have any association or connection with any other translation. Can it be that you can own one to consult privately from time to time, but you could not carry it to the church building? Or if you did, you must transport it in a brown paper sack. Now, to what extent will we make the translation issue a test of fellowship? Make no mistake about it, some are on the verge of doing this. Some brethren have written articles in which they have stated that the American Standard Translation of 1901 is not the Word of God at all, but it is of the devil. And others are almost at that point, they allow only the King James and then begrudgingly the American Standard Translation. Brethren, it is not a feasible position to suggest that a man's soundness be determined by the translation which he uses. His soundness is to be determined by what he teaches from any translation. There have been denominationalists for centuries who have been arguing their denominational doctrines from the King James translation. 
And there are brethren who use the New International Version, which I don't recommend. It's much looser in its translating philosophy than is necessary. But there are brethren whom I'm not aware of any false doctrine which they teach who by and large utilize that translation. Now, though I would not feel comfortable myself employing the New International Version, I cannot make that a test of fellowship when the brother, so far as everyone knows, is teaching the truth. You can't simply hang a tag of suspicion on somebody based upon the Bible version which they use. Now, there's no question about the fact that there are some grave dangers involved in some of the modern translations. Many of the modern translations. Most of the modern translations, perhaps. But at the same time, we are not taking a balanced approach when we spend 90% of our time railing about the weaknesses of some of the newer translations and we totally ignore some of the problems in the King James Version translation and even in the American Standard Version. If you're not aware of the fact that there are some Calvinistic influences in the King James translation of the Bible, then you're simply not informed about things. There are some problems with some of the translations of the various passages in the King James. I think they're minimal compared to some of the egregious errors that are found in some of the more modern translations. But they are there nonetheless. Now, a few years ago, I wrote a little booklet entitled The Bible Translation Controversy, and I made an argument in that booklet with reference to the translation matter, that I have not seen anybody in this brotherhood responsibly address. And it is this. In the third century B.C., the Jews translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And it's called the Septuagint version. Now there are numerous significant differences between the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek Old Testament. Numerous significant differences. As a matter of fact, it is the consensus of good, sound, conservative Bible scholarship that by and large, the Septuagint version is vastly inferior to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Some of the books are done very well, such as the Pentateuch. And other books, the Septuagint translators just butchered. And yet, did you know? that our Lord frequently when quoting the Old Testament to make his various points would quote from the Septuagint, the Greek version instead of the Hebrew. And dozens and dozens and dozens of quotations in the New Testament by inspired writers come from the Greek version of the Old Testament as opposed to the Hebrew. Now here's a point I want to make. I do not believe that there is an English translation in existence that is as bad as the Septuagint compared to the Old Testament Hebrew text. And yet our Lord and the inspired writers of the New Testament quoted from that less than accurate version. 
Now, they never quoted any of the questionable parts. But why did they do that? Because the Septuagint version was the common version used by the average person in the Greek-oriented first century society. Now, I want to tell you something. The Lord and His inspired New Testament pensmen would be in big trouble with some of our brethren today. They'd be suggesting that they were off on the translation issue. That they were loose on the translation issue. So we've got to try to use the best translation that we can, but we've got to allow some individuality, some exercise of judgment. I've probably got 20 or 30 different translations in my library. And I consult them all from time to time. But as a daily study Bible, I want the most accurate translation that I can get. The King James translation is a good translation. The American Standard translation is a good translation. I think the new King James Bible is an improvement over the old, certainly in terms of clarity. The new American Standard Bible is a good translation. got to allow some liberty so far as how brethren employ these various translations. Now, if you want to make any comments, feel perfectly free to do so and disagree with me. That's all right. I'm not going to write you up. Um, in this matter of the translation question, I totally agree with you. And respond to this, if a congregation, eldership says that you can only preach out of the King James Version, however, you are a man, and I know several men in the Brotherhood who actually carry around their Greek Testament, and they preach from the Greek New Testament, would they be prohibited from preaching if they actually can read the Greek well enough and translate? Troy Cummings, uh, as, as one example, who frequently will do that. Would that prohibit that man from preaching in that congregation if he frequently just carries his Greek New Testament. If I worked with a congregation where the elders requested that I use the King James Version in my preaching and public teaching, I would uh, agree to that stipulation. I really don't think that they would probably require me not ever to refer to anything beyond the actual text of the King James translation. I've never heard of a body of men that, that ever did anything of that nature. But I would try to work under their oversight and to accommodate their request in that particular regard. And if I didn't feel comfortable with that, then I would move on to another situation and not create any difficulty within the local congregation. Someone else. Here's a good brother back here. Michael. <coughs> I, like yourself, are a little concerned about saying anything without giving a lot of thought. And just a little short thought that I had, may, these words may not come out right. I want to ask you a question, and you can give a yes or no, or explain it however you'd like to. Sure. You mentioned that there were some, some points in the King James Version that were wrong, or a bad translation. Do you believe those, you did say as small as they were, do you believe those would cost you your soul? Were you to believe them? If perhaps you took them as an isolated matter without what the Bible elsewhere teaches on that same theme, yes. For example, in Acts 2, 47, the King James translation says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, the Greek text does not say that. It says the Lord added together those that were being saved. And the suggestion he added such as should be saved suggests the concept of predestination. Those who should be saved, those whom God had predetermined to save, such were added to the church. 
Now, Professor Plumptree, who was one of the translators of the American Standard Version, commented upon the King James rendition of Acts 247, and he said clearly there is Calvinistic influence in this particular passage. Uh, to mention another example, I believe it's in Galatians 5. The King James Version reads like this, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh that you cannot do the things that you would. That is not what the Greek says. The Greek says that you may not do, that you should not do certain things. But the King James translation leaves the impression that you do not have the power. The idea of hereditary depravity seems to be suggested in the English translation, but it is not conveyed in the original language. Now, those two points are dangerous points, but you can take the King James translation and refute those very points with other passages. Do you believe you can do that the same with the other trans, the newer translations? Yes, I like think example, to a certain degree. For example, that you in can. Romans, pardon about me? the sinful nature in Romans. The sinful you can nature turn in Romans. In the is New very... International Version, for example, since that's the one that uses that, and show that it does not mean sinful nature in in the Book of Romans. Yeah, you know, that's a very serious problem in the NIV, the, the sinful nature thing. Mm -hmm. I am not sure, however, that uh, without. I'm not all that familiar with the various renditions of the different other passages in the NIV. But I'm not sure that there might not be other passages that would clearly refute the concept of, of sinful nature, even in the NIV. I'm not sure there are either. Yeah, I, I, and, I don't know. And that's why, though I see a, a friend of mine or a fellow laborer carrying the, some newer modern versions, I'm not saying I'm withdrawing fellowship from you, but I'm... I will go to him and say, I'd like to discuss this with you because I believe there are some problems. And he may say, well, if you use the King James, I want to discuss it with you. But we need to do some discussing and we need to get down to some serious study because as far as I'm concerned, we're being sold a bill of goods with the New International Version with brethren saying, well, I thought it was what the church adopted. Hmm. That's all they use basically unless the congregation is, is awake and vital. Uh, that's all they use in these Bible Bowl quizzes that are used in different areas of town uh, where people in Texas travel to different towns. Some congregations do their own, and they use the more accurate translations. But we need to be a lot more careful than we are, and if someone's carrying it, we need to, we need to talk with them about it, be very serious about it, because I believe there are more... I don't personally believe, and I want to study what you've just said about in the King James Version, but I believe the... Problems in the newer versions will cause your soul to be sent to hell if you believe those and teach those. I'm not so sure I believe that with the King James, though I'm going to study the passages that you gave with that. I appreciate it. I think you've taken a real balanced, rational approach there. My problem is with brethren who say when they see somebody carrying uh, something other than the King James Version or the American Standard, that he is automatically liberal. We won't have him for a gospel meeting. We won't recommend him. We don't know where he's standing. He's loose just because you see him using some other translation than the two standard ones which we have generally employed in the church across the years. I think that is just as dangerous and extreme as going far in the other direction. Any other comments on this particular matter? Yes, here's a brother back here. I want to say first of all that uh, your opening comments there uh, I appreciate very much in regards to where do you start uh, obviously you know there's no set uh, it's hard to know specifically where to start on this I personally have a great respect for the elderships and there are some even in this area who uh, request only the King James and the American Standard be used from the pulpit. Uh, I preached from 1984 until 1988 almost exclusively from the New American Standard Version. I studied quite a bit from King James American and New American. All that time when I referred to Romans 10.10 10, I quoted what I had learned previously from the King James uh, it wasn't until 1988 that just in doing some random reading 
I really took a look at what the New American says in Romans 10, 10. And as a preacher, I'd like to say this. I think that when it comes to a passage which deals specifically with the salvation of our souls, I personally am not going to use anything from the pulpit uh, that teaches error as blatantly as the New American, the NIV, and many others do on Romans 10.10. 10. If you look real closely in the NIV and the NASV, uh, it teaches that if you believe and confess, you are righteous and you are saved. If you look in Mark chapter 3 and verse 11, the unclean spirits did that very thing. Uh, I would hate to teach and to preach uh, from a version, have a visitor come in, see what I'm using, have them leave, assuming that that is a proper translation, have them run across Romans 10.10 10, and to, in the privacy of their own setting, believe that they've had their soul saved. That's all I wanted to say. All right. Thank you. Here's a brother right here. The one question that I often pose to myself uh, in speaking of these new uh, versions, um, what if we had had nothing but the NIV? Where would the church be and where would our souls be? If that's all we've ever had to read and study, we are we're greatly benefited by the King James, the American Standard. But my problem is, where are we going to be when the New International becomes the Bible that has so long been the King James and the King James is put aside? Where are we going to be then? That's, that's a serious question to me. It really is. Let me make an observation here. <clears throat> I see coming on the horizon a great translation crisis. And for this very reason, the American Standard Version is just about to go out of print, probably forever. Star Bible Corporation has been the only company publishing that now for some years. And I was told just the other day when I attempted to order one of the leather-bound teacher's editions of the American Standard Version, that they had less than 30 copies remaining and that they did not intend to reprint. Now, they have a hardback edition, and when that's gone, they don't intend to reprint that. So the American Standard Version may be well on its way to being gone. Now, let me, let me tell you something very practical. And you can disagree with this. You can become agitated about it, you can do whatever you want to. But the generation coming on now, in another 10, 15, or 20 years, is not going to be using the old 1611 King James Version. Now, either a new translation, a good translation is going to have to come along, or we're going to have to say, well, yes, there is a viability in the New King James Version. It's easy to understand. The New American Standard Version. The RSV, which we've criticized very severely, is coming out in the middle of this year sometime in a new revised version. We don't know what that's going to be like. I don't have very high hopes. I would like to have. But what are we going to do? It's going to be a serious problem. Did someone else have a comment? But no. Let me ask you, Wayne, to con have you done any study on Romans 10.10 10 and the uh, grammar there? No, I'm not familiar. I was not familiar with the uh, thought that the brother introduced back to Okay. Well, the Greek term that's used uh, in that passage is ace into. Mm -hmm. King James translation uses the archaic unto, which uh, in my studies I found to be strictly an archaic term, and it's not, in fact, some of our brethren have preached that you believe unto, you repent unto, you confess unto, and you're baptized into. 
But if we'll do a little study on that passage, the word is ace. In which case, the problem is not translation. The problem is understanding what's being taught there. And uh, there are a number of passages that tell us we're saved by faith. Now, we understand that to mean that faith is a part of the process by which we become a Christian. And uh, I wondered if you'd done some study on that. Would like to comment on that? No, I just uh, I was not familiar with how the book was translation was that New American Standard you said. I was not familiar with how that read. I don't use that, and so I just uh, was not aware of that particular rendition. Is that all on this, Brother Gary Workman? Wayne, I, I agree uh, with everything that's been said about the dangers of modern translations, and I personally use the King James and American Standard uh, about 95% of the time, or really all the time, unless I'm looking for something uh, that I might use for illustration purposes where somebody perhaps rendered it better. Um, but what concerns me at the same time, and I know it does you as well, is what you alluded to at the beginning of your comments on this. When there are brethren who are now holding up the names and putting them in print of the likes of Foy Wallace Jr. and Robert R. Taylor and saying these men are loose on the version issue, we're in trouble. Yes. And let, let, me, let me add this also. You, you asked where, where are we going to be in a few years. Uh, if we think back over the 150 more years that brethren have been meeting together and attempting to be the New Testament church on this continent, you stop and think about commentaries. What did brethren use for commentaries? I remember the time when uh, brethren hardly knew anything besides Barnes and Clark. Those were the names I heard in my childhood. All the brethren knew about Barnes and Clark, but they didn't know much about anybody especially within the church. And yet I never knew of anybody who used those, those commentaries who accepted the errors of Barnes and Clark. They used them to help them out in passages, but they had enough sense to sift truth from error. And I am just optimistic enough to believe that the same will hold true when it comes to their use of translations. All right, let me go to the next question. <clears throat> In Revelation 2, 4, the church at Ephesus had left its first love. What had they left? In my judgment, the expression first love in that particular passage denotes the kind of initial love which had characterized those people when they had first obeyed the gospel. It was an enthusiastic, passionate, dedicated type of love. But as the years had passed, if we may borrow an expression from Matthew 24, verse 12, that I think contains an analogous idea. Jesus spoke of the love of some waxing cold. And so I think the allusion in Revelation 2 is to the fact that those people when they had initially obeyed the gospel, had had a burning, passionate love for the Lord. But they had waned from that. Their first love, their initial love, had grown dim so that they needed to repent and to rekindle that type of fervor in their lives. And that's my answer in 25 words or less. If someone would care to amplify that or comment, I'd be happy. Yes, sir. I just wondered if there's any connection between the loyalty of the brethren at Ephesus, of their love of the truth and gospel, and the trials that they went through with those who said they were apostles. And they weren't. Um, to me, that's one of the greatest difficulties of going through problems and trials within the church like that and maintaining a first love. I just, you know, it says they were commended for their stance of the truth. 
But so oftentimes in that, uh, it's so easy for those who are faithful to the truth to lose their love in the process. I think this is an area in which we have to be very careful. Now, where that was, there's any relation, that was one of their commendations and one of the, you know, condemnations was the loss of their love. And I, I, I may, I kind of feel a connection is there because I've been in some church problems when things were going along great, but when it came to standing for the truth and through that process, both sides lost a lot of that first love. And I don't know whether that's a connection in there or not in that passage. But it's I'm not sure whether or not it is in that particular mm -hmm. context or not, but I think you have put your finger on a very vital point. And that is the fact that when the church becomes so embroiled with constant internal controversy, it absolutely wipes you out to where you get so tired of something all the time, fomenting and working and sapping your energy and draining your spiritual enthusiasm that you get to the point where sometimes you begin to lose your vision of what this is really all about. And I think that we are perhaps very near that point in the church right now. There are so many genuine problems which deservedly demand our attention. But then, in addition to those which are significant enough, we have manufactured all of these other peripheral issues which need not be nearly so dramatic and nearly so big. And we have heaped upon ourselves problem after problem after problem to where we're just operating at a hair-trigger level. We're just ready to jump at any moment. And you just cannot thrive and operate on a high spiritual plane in that kind of an environment. I think that point was well made. And all of us could certainly take some direction. Here's a brother who has a comment. Yes, sir. Brother Jackson, I, I'm not a preacher, so I'm really not supposed to talk. But say something more bad this, all this love that these Ephesians left, I'm sure included their love for the Lord. But along with that, I'd like to say that it probably included love of the brotherhood. I think certainly that would be involved. Brother Jackson, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it was the fervor that they once had that they lost... Uh, I began a series on love two Sunday nights ago that I hope to continue for a number of Sunday nights. And last Sunday night preached on what Jesus called the first and great commandment, which is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. The soul, sum total of, of our being, every part of us to love God. And Obviously, they had lost that. They, they lost that fervor of their entire being of loving God and wanting to obey His commandments. So I think you got that right. I did want to make one other comment in relation to this uh, concerning the things you said about this hair trigger idea and it seems like that uh, we have so much going on in the brotherhood today and in the way of real tremendously frightening liberalism I've listened to two tapes recently one that was delivered at the Nashville Jubilee uh, by a brother in, in our brotherhood who basically said you know we ought not to let whatever doctrinal differences we have concern us at all just I love one another like porcupines in November, just kind of huddle up to one another, and despite the fact that we're prickling one another, just let love uh, cover the multitude of differences there. And then I listened to another tape the other day of a, of a, a brother who preached out at uh, the youth forum out at uh, Love a Christian College, and uh, I found myself just really almost being in tears as I listened to some of the things that he talked about and advocated that are taking place in the brotherhood of a serious nature, uh, women leading in worship, uh, things along that line. And then I, I hear us who, who I feel like, you know, basically agree on the authority of the scriptures and wanting to have justification for all we do in worship and practice, splitting hairs over little minute issues, dividing ourselves and splintering ourselves further when it seems to me that we ought to be rallying, rallying around one another in the word of God trying to prevent the rank liberalism that is carrying the brotherhood off by the droves.
Well said. I know the tape you're referring to, Randy Mayu spoke at the Lubbock Christian University Youth Rally back two days before the San Francisco earthquake. And his presentation on that occasion was just about as earth-shaking as what we experienced on the West Coast. I believe it's the most radical thing I've ever heard. And I have written a review of that particular presentation that will be published in the February issue of Christian Courier. I don't devote this paper to uh, an exposure of brethren month after month after month, but occasionally certain situations are so dramatic and so dangerous that I think those who have some degree of influence, however small it might be, do have a responsibility to speak out. Oh, from beginning to end was about the worst thing he said. But the instrumental music issue, he, uh, he suggested that that was really a rather irrelevant matter. Uh, Grace alone, uh, he suggested that if we took a poll from the audience, wonder how many might think that Mother Teresa was saved. Uh, he thanked God for the preaching that Billy Graham is doing behind the Iron Curtain. He suggested that if uh, a great persecution was to come upon the church and we had to meet underground, that we would not be checking passports as people came in the door and inquiring, were you sprinkled, were you immersed, this and that. Uh, there are young women, he said, in the church who are majoring in Bible at our various Christian colleges who want to be ministers in the church, preaching to both men and women. He said, Do we, uh, will we have no place for these in the next few years? And he concluded by saying that in the 1990s, diversity will be the only game in town. And he threw down the gauntlet. He threw out the challenge. And he said, if you're not willing to diversify, you have had it. It is over. You are out of business. And as I listened to that tape, and I heard the audience laugh. Oh, he would pull jokes, and they, he, they laughed. They, he had them in his hand. I thought, oh, my, what is the condition of the church. The fact of the matter is, I have taken that sermon and another by Larry James, which is a defense of instrumental music, in which he ridicules every argument we've ever made, and argues strongly that there is nothing unscriptural about the use of instrumental music. He preaches for the Richardson East Church, I guess right here in your area. <coughs> And I've taken both of those sermons and put them back to back on a tape. And in this review that I have written, I'm going to offer it to brethren to write for, to hear for themselves. I think you need a good dose of shockability. Instead of hearing what some of us tell you is occurring second-handedly, you need to hear it. And like this brother said, you'll have tears in your eyes before it's over an alarm in your soul. It's later than we think. Anybody want to say anything about that? Somebody might have additional information here. Yes? Well, not particularly on that specifically, but the whole gamut of things. Uh, it, it's so hard not to see a parallel of the truth being uh, brought out just in sackcloth almost. You say that the, probably one of the most recognized accurate versions will go away. And people like to hear the things you've just repeated. The people generally aren't a very good gauge, but they buy the Bibles. And if they don't buy them, they aren't published. Right? right. But when they do buy them, we have so many versions. Can we know the truth? Will it make us free or confused? What can we believe? I, I, I think we need some reassurance on this. I, I think someplace there's truth. Maybe not in any one version or any one opinion, but there's some place, and it would help me, and I'm not a preacher either, just to know, 
Can't we believe something? Isn't there some comfort for someplace? Yes. Anything further? Brother Gary Workman, right over here. I just want to get the jump uh, before you grab another question there. Since we're on to this kind of uh, discussion that we've been on the last few moments, uh, tell us how serious do you believe that the Max King Doctrine is today? And what do you predict the future is going to be of that particular movement? I know you've been involved in some matters along this line. Well, for the benefit of those who may not know what the Max King Doctrine is, it is a concept concerning Bible prophecy which suggests that all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled and was fulfilled by A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. So that such matters as the second coming of Christ are not future, but the second coming of Christ occurred in A.D. 70. So that the resurrection of the dead, as per 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is not a future phenomenon. The Max King Doctrine argues that there is not going to be any future bodily resurrection. But they spiritualize that chapter and suggest that it's talking about the fact that between 30 A.D. and 70 A.D., the church was buried under the oppressive influence of Judaism. So that when the Jewish nation was destroyed in 70 A.D., there was then a resurrection of the church out of that persecuting influence. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is not talking about the physical body at all. It's not talking about a future resurrection at all, but it's talking about the resurrection of the spiritual body of Christ, the church, from Judaism. Now the Max King Doctrine has been around, what, for 20 years or so, maybe a little longer. And it generally has not made much of an impact in our brotherhood. But every now and then there is a pocket of it that pops up. And we've just had that very thing out uh, in our area. And it's devastating. I don't know of any concept that I have ever run across that is so utterly bizarre and so absolutely filled with error from beginning to end. So I don't think it's going to have a tremendous impact overall in the church. But you need to be aware of what it is and be on the lookout for it because it will make some inroads along the way. And it could be where you are. Anything further on that, Brother Melson? One of the funny things about that doctrine, since you and I have been corresponding about it, uh, it comes in very quietly. Another congregation in uh, the suburb of Dayton has had a split because the preacher has, for the last two and a half years, been gradually teaching the brethren this concept. And when the brethren finally, uh, he finally came out and said, oh, I don't believe this on the resurrection, they called in Terry Varner and they wouldn't even allow Brother Varner to preach because he had been sowing seeds of this particular doctrine, and there are several other little pockets uh, in southern Ohio, uh, these brethren who have been just imbibing on uh, Max King's concepts over the years. The thing is, they're not coming out publicly and saying this, but gradually teaching bit by bit by bit. So the question is, you know, we really don't know how many individuals are uh, involved with this, and uh, it's, it seems to be spreading in other parts of the country, but very quietly. Well, as Peter says, they're really bringing this thing in by stealth. Right. Here's a gentleman back here who has a comment. Uh, my name is Eddie Parrish. I'm a student here in the School of Preaching. And I have a brother-in-law who is very deep in this Max King doctrine. And uh, he is even to the point now to where he has gotten three or four that agree with him in this area. He lives oh, in the Cedar Hill area. And uh, he's even to the point now to where he has gotten uh, 
very sophisticated recording equipment and is making tapes and is just sending them off all over the country to people that are wanting them. And uh, I've noticed the same thing that Brother Melson said that, you know, he won't espouse this publicly very much, but he'll pick two or three from the congregation where he used to attend and uh, get them to believing it and then they start out and they pick two or three and they'll uh, just propagate it that way instead of doing it publicly. So the the doctrine is being published on cassette tapes and uh, and uh, by writing and everything has been put out throughout the whole country. You know, that's a very unusual observation because I am finding out the more I delve into this that the very same methodology for proselyting this doctrine apparently is following a pattern all over the country. And I'm wondering in my own mind if Max King isn't tutoring and schooling these individuals in how to take over a church. Because we have a preacher on the West Coast who has adopted this doctrine, and he's doing the very same thing. He's made tapes on the resurrection and various aspects of this concept, and he absolutely will not let them out to anyone that he suspects disagrees or who wants to review them critically. But anyone who has a soft spot that he feels is a potential convert, then they uh, are granted access to them. It's a very controlled situation. So there appears to be, perhaps, a conspiracy in the method of propagating the doctrine. Here's a question. <clears throat> It is, again, another one of these that requires some degree of subjectivity. How can a few faithful Christians deal with a man who has a strong personality and serves as an elder and has an attitude such as Diotrephes, 3 John 9 and 10? Well, now, how do you define a Diotrephes in the first place? Some people's Diotrephes is another person's champion. Who is the Diotrephes? Who is the man who simply is sound in the faith, but he's exerting a strong influence for truth? And who is the individual who is genuinely abusive and overbearing? That determination has to be made first of all. And likely, various brethren will make it differently depending upon how they view the individual. Now, what do you do if you're in a congregation and you feel that there is an elder or elders who have exceeded the bounds of their authority and they are, to use Peter's terminology, lording it over the flock? What do you do about that? Well, first of all, you can approach the brother privately and talk to him about it and see if that will get you anywhere. And if it does not, if you find that there are others who share that common opinion and the elder's disposition is so openly flagrant as to be generally recognized, there may need to be a group of brethren who approach the individual and talk to him about his disposition. If that does no good, uh, there might be a point where it would be necessary for someone to rebuke him publicly. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 5 deals with. Against an elder, receive not an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. But them, them who? Elders who sin... Rebuke before all that the rest may be in fear. Now I'd call attention to a particular grammatical point in that passage that is very significant. The word sin in the Greek Testament is a present tense participle. And it describes elders who are absolutely out of control. They are rebellious themselves against the Word of God and they are practicing a consistent pattern of open sin. Once the case against them has been built with adequate evidence and testimony, 
they may be publicly rebuked. And certainly there could be a point where the congregation approaches an elder and asks him to resign. A congregation that has the right to ask a man because of his Bible qualifications to serve as an elder if he disqualifies himself by actions or attitude. The same congregation has the right to ask him to cease serving in that capacity. If that is not the case, then you have an out-of-control situation, a built-in dictatorship that will absolutely ruin the church. But you had better be very careful. Very careful. Elders need to be given every benefit of the doubt. And they may be privy to information that you are not aware of. They may be handling a situation in a manner that is consistent with their judgment and you don't have all the facts. And they may seem to be acting in an autocratic fashion when in reality they may not be. So you better be sure you have the goods. But then in the final analysis, if you feel that there is one or more elders who are acting in a diatrophian fashion, and you simply cannot tolerate the situation any longer, then move elsewhere to a new environment where you can work in behalf of the Lord's interest. But there's so much of this that is open to judgment. When do you do this? When do you say this? When do you make the move? How do you go about it? That has to be facilitated in an environment of spirituality and not reactionism, not hostility, not anger, not lashing out. It's got to be done coolly and calmly and consistently with Bible principles. And too often the case is things go so far that they're out of control and everybody's just reacting and the whole situation is so explosive that it just destroys the church. Well, not to let it reach that point. Anybody have a comment or an observation to make in that connection? Well, that brings us pretty close to the end here, Dave. How about how long? All right, I think we'll just go ahead and conclude at that point if, if we can. Yes, sir. Johnny Ramsey. I wanted to say this as we bring to a close. I am so glad you feel uncomfortable and ill at ease in an arrangement like this. Because if you felt real good, it'd be so rich we couldn't take it. <laughs> Brother Wayne? Yes. Back in the 60s or early 70s, Brother Roy Deaver wrote an article entitled Transition Completed. It was in the Gospel Advocate and also in the Biblical Notes. It dealt with the use of the word ace in Romans 10. He showed why the translators of the King James and American Standard used the word unto instead of into. I think if you'd write Roy, he'd be glad to give it to anyone who would like to copy. Well, I'm certainly happy to know about that. Anything further before we conclude this session? What I'm going to say is that I think that, that mainly this is a psychological warfare that the liberals, the, the whole theme of the last three days of forum has been the liberals are hurting us. The liberals are taking our students, our children. And I think they're, they're fighting a psychological warfare against us. If, if any of these false teachers can come in, they may push that without letting us know that they're doing it or doing anything that they can do to destroy us or hurt us in some way because they want to redo us, remake us. One preacher said he wanted to make the Church of Christ into a Pentecostal church. You know, we need to think about how are we going to fight How do you fight against a large group that may include lots of institutions in which they are brainwashing us, putting out literature and books, and trying to use psychological warfare against us, get us to divide against ourselves, fuss, 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 or debate, debate, and so on. 
I'm not saying debate's wrong. I mean fuss among ourselves. Right. You want me to tell you what the number one problem is? It is the vast, vast lack of Bible knowledge characteristic of the church today. Never have so many of us known so little about the Word of God. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. My people are led into captivity for a lack of knowledge. Isaiah 5, 13. Until we get back to filling the hearts and souls and minds of our people with the Bible, we're going to continue to see them tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine.